Get your Bibles, get them out. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look into God's Word. I'm excited this morning to be kicking off a new series of messages, and, and we're going to call it Aiming for Heaven. We got that from, uh, from our Faith Promise rally, and, and uh, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking into the book of Acts together, okay, the book of Acts. The book of Acts focuses, if you know, on, on the, the birth of the church, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this, this power to continue this mission that Jesus gave the church to take this message to the ends of the earth, right? To make disciples in the nations. And so that's going to be our focus over the next uh, month or so together. So have your Bibles with you. Get them out. Get them open. And, and I invite you to join me in the book of Acts together this morning. Just to give you a quick background on what Acts is about. I, I just said it, but... I, um, little details on it. We attribute the book uh, to Luke, the same guy we attribute the gospel of Luke to, that he wrote the book of Acts, kind of to be like a second part of the book of Luke. And uh, it's sort of, uh, I guess, a, a compendium to the gospel of Luke, you could say, just the ongoing mission of what Jesus and, uh, and his church after the resurrection and the ascension into heaven. Luke was a physician from the writings of the church, we've, we've learned that Luke was actually brought up and trained by some of the disciples, and that the Bible tells us that he actually went on missionary journeys with the Apostle Paul. So he's, a, he's been in there, he's been around the disciples, he's been around people like the Apostle Paul and learned from them and learned with them, and he uh, went on these missionary journeys and kept notes. You'll see in his writing throughout the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts uh, that he's very detail-oriented. Okay, he doesn't like to leave things to guesswork, you could say. And so he wants to show evidence and, uh, of what really went on and what took place in those moments. Okay? So we're, uh, we're going to cover the book of Acts in, in, in this series together. And obviously the book of Acts is like 28 chapters, I believe. We're not going to cover the entire thing. We'd be here till like November. Uh, but we are going to kind of pick our way through it and, uh, and share the story of the church uh, as it got its beginning. So... Join me in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start right at the beginning. Acts chapter 1, beginning at the very first verse. Lean into somebody, open your own Bible. Uh, uh, we'll throw the words on the screen if technology allows for us here. And this is what the book of Acts says, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, so that's the, the gospel of Luke he's referencing. And if you actually go to Luke, you'd see that he uh, introduces and he says, hey, Theophilus, this is for you. So, um, this book is also written to Theophilus. So my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about or all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of of God. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. So, so Jesus has, has died, he's been uh, buried, he's raised to new life, okay? And over a period of 40 days, he has now appeared to a multitude of people. He's with the disciples, he's spending time with the disciples. Uh, scripture says that he lived with them, he walked among them, that he actually broke bread and dined with them. Not, not in a spirit form or not in some force, but the physical Man, Jesus was there among his people. Amazing, right? They saw him crucified. They saw him risen back to life and, and, and that he broke bread with them and, and continued to share about the kingdom of God. On one such occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Somebody say wait. Wait, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if you read through the Gospels, prior to Jesus' crucifixion, you'll, you'll see him over and over again teaching about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. This is what it's going to be like. He, he, he shares it in parables. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. When the kingdom of God arrives, this is what it's going to be. And, and I think the disciples, just like they did when they... Uh, you know, they had their own thoughts about the Messiah and what he was going to look like. I think they hear what they want to hear from Jesus. And so they ask him, so, all right, Jesus, now that you're back, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? 
He's talking about the kingdom of God, and they say, so now are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to set us free from Roman oppression? Um, and Jesus' message to them right here he, is that this is bigger than that. All of this is bigger than that. The kingdom of God is way bigger than the nation of Israel being freed from Rome. This is about everybody. It's about people in every place, in, in, in every nation on the planet being freed from the oppression of sin. Okay? And coming to know and to experience this Jesus and, and the goodness uh, of his gospel. Okay? So listen to what he says to them. This is, this is, I think it's kind of funny. He basically tells them, none of your business. Right? Don't waste your time with that. When are you coming back, Jesus? When, when are you going to restore Israel? Don't waste your time with that. When somebody says, hey, uh, Jesus is coming back. We think it's when the hail bop comet passes by, Jesus is coming back. Right? We just heard it with the eclipse. The eclipse is here. I think Jesus is probably coming back. Don't waste your time with that. Don't worry about all that. That's what he's telling them. Okay? He says, that's not for you to know. Not for you to worry about that. Not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Here's what you should worry about, okay? And this is our key verse. This is where we're going to spend our time today in verse 8. He says, but, so rather than worrying about all that stuff, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, so rather then concerning yourself with that stuff, here's something to do. Okay, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and when he does, you're going to have a job to do. And your job is going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. Now this verse, verse 8, is crucial, I believe, for the theology of the church, for the, for the mission of the church. This is, this is why the church is here, okay? This is why we're here, friends, and what we're supposed to be doing. And honestly, if you want to look at the book of Acts and, and, and ask the question, what is the book of Acts really about? It's about this verse, chapter 1, verse 8. Okay? Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to come. That's going to happen in, in chapter 2 at Pentecost. We're going to talk about that next week, so come on back. Then you're going to be my witnesses, he says. That's in chapters. 2 through 7, that happens in Jerusalem. In chapters 8 through 12, it's in Judea and Samaria. And then chapters 13 to 28, it's to the ends of the earth with the Apostle Paul eventually winding up in Roman prison, right? And so that's what the book of Acts is about. It's about this message to the church in chapter 1, verse 8, and it's unpacked throughout the rest of the book, okay? So I have a couple points that I want you to see here. And, and then I want to give you uh, several takeaways, okay? So the first thing I want you to see here, and if you're uh, a note taker this morning, I encourage you to do that. Write this down. This is the first thing I want you to see. Spirit power is required for missional living. Spirit power. Jesus said, wait till the spirit comes, right? Spirit power is required for missional living. He said, until the Holy Spirit comes, don't go anywhere. Just stay right here and wait, okay? And then when the Spirit comes, he's going to give you the power to go and do what I'm commanding you to do. I love this quote I found from uh, R.C. Sproul. He said, if you try to do this in your own power, you will fail. The reason for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not to make us feel spiritual. It's not to give us a spiritual high. It's so that we can do the job that Jesus gave the church to do. If you try to be a witness with no spirit power, you won't be able to do it. Spirit power is required for missional living. I think that uh, there are a lot of believers who are exhausted, who are living exhausted and living anxious and, 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 and living fearful and, and maybe run out of gas. Okay, you don't need to stick your hand up, but you're out of gas today. And there are many things in life that contribute to that. But could it be that one of the things that contributes that, to that in our lives is because we're trying to fight a spiritual battle with our own worldly weapons? We're trying to do what Jesus asked us to do 
apart from the Spirit of God. Because we think we can. We could do that. Yeah, we could take care of that. We can handle that. We can do that. We're strong, right? We're strong enough. We're, we're organized. We're, 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 we're well-trained. We can do that. And Jesus says, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You might as well just stay put. Just stay right here because you need the Spirit power for what I'm asking you to do. You can be a good person, you can be spiritual, you can be driven, you can be dedicated, you can be disciplined. If you do not have the power of the Spirit living inside of you, you have no chance of accomplishing what Jesus has asked you to do. Right? As you search through Scripture, you see that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, is that he came to reveal Jesus. Jesus says this in John 16, he said, the Spirit will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. The Spirit's going to make it known to you, to the church. The Holy Spirit will come on you and make these things known to you and empower you so that you can be Jesus' witness. So that people here, there, and everywhere can, can come to see Jesus and come to know Jesus, to know about the goodness and the, the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus. The Spirit wants people to see Jesus. He wants people to know Jesus. And listen, without the Spirit, you and I don't look like Jesus. Okay? So in this moment, Jesus is saying to them, wait for the Holy Spirit to come on you. But, but, but church, for all of us today who are in Christ, you've already met Jesus, you know Jesus, you've received salvation when you receive salvation, you receive the promised Holy Spirit. So you now have the power that is required for missional living. Do you see it? You've been given that power. You have spirit power that's required for missional living. And Jesus says, live missionally. Amen? Number two, missional living is required for all believers. So spirit power is required for missional living. And number two... Missional living is required for every one of us. Okay, so if you're, if you're in Jesus, this is a requirement of your life. This isn't the Marines, right? It's not the, the few, the proud. Okay, it's not just the special or the called or, 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 or for some people or for the gifted. It's for every single follower of Jesus. This is the mission. Okay, that Jesus in this verse here gave marching orders to the church. This is how the Church of the Nazarene defines it. I, I pulled this from our manual. It says, The mission of the church in the world is to share in the redemptive and reconciling ministry of Christ in the power of the Spirit. The mission of the church in the world is to share in the redemptive and reconciling ministry of Christ in the power of the Spirit. That's our job. Amen? That's the mission of the church. It's what we're here to do. Can I just say to you, it's not just for people who are on staff at the church. Okay? It's for the church. It's for everybody. Everybody who professes faith in Christ, who is alive in Christ, that's our job. Okay? Well, see, I want, to, I want us to see this today, that, that the church doesn't fulfill its mission just by us coming here. We gather here, we, we sing songs, we worship Jesus, we, we, we have class together, we fellowship together, we dig, get in the word of God, we get all fueled up, we learn all these things, and it's amazing. And you should treasure this, because not everybody gets to do it. And we should keep doing this, and, and, and we should love this, and honor this, and spur each other on to love and good works. But the church is at its strongest when we all gather, and we, and we learn, and we worship, and then we scatter out into the world to everywhere and anywhere we go with the purpose that Jesus Christ has given us as the church, as believers in him. The message he sends to the church in John 20, verse 21, is as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The Father sent Jesus on mission. And Jesus, sent it, Jesus says, I'm sending you the same way he sent me, on mission. I heard it this week. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as an unsent Christian. There's no such thing as an unsent Christian, and it's so true. There isn't a single person that receives 
the grace and the love and the mercy of Jesus that Jesus has not sent out on that same mission as a minister of reconciliation to the world. Me included, by the way. I think that one of the problems in the church today is that uh, we receive the gospel, we receive this message of Jesus, we receive the salvation in Jesus, and then we want to eject from the world. Right? We want to surround ourselves with people who look like us, and people who think like us, and people who believe exactly the way we do, and everybody else, we just keep them at arm's length. That's not the gospel, though. Okay? Now, I'm not suggesting you should surround yourself with nothing but non-believers, either. That's not my, what I'm saying to you at all. But the goal upon receiving Jesus and receiving salvation isn't to eject from the world, but to be ignited and sent back into the world as a witness for Christ. That's the mission of the church. That's Jesus' instruction. That's Jesus' plan for every single believer. Jesus calls us to be his witnesses to the world. So what does that look like? What does it mean to be a witness for Jesus? I think it means that we're called to live a life that broadcasts to the world that we have something better than what you currently have. Amen? We have something better than what the world has to offer. I heard a pastor say one time, live a life that leads to why. I want to live my life in a way that makes people who aren't following Jesus ask me questions. Like, what? Why, why, are you, why are you full of joy? Why, why are you like that, man? You went through all this stuff. You're, you're going through this mess. You have all this going on. How is that possible? How are you like this? Why are you still so joyful? Why are you still following Jesus? Why do you still? Why? Live a life that makes people want to ask you why, ask you questions. But at some point you need to say it. We have a preschool here in our building. Most of you probably know that. And there's times when, uh, you know, the kids are going back and forth all day long throughout the day. And, and I'll hear one of the teachers occasionally say, uh, use your words. You ever said that, parents? When your kids aren't, when they're trying to just, what are you trying to say? Use your words. There comes a point when our actions need to be coupled with using our words. And I think for some of us, we... We kind of settled into this, you know, if they, if they want to know, they'll ask me, right? So being a witness for me means I go to, I go to work, I go on the job, and that means that while I'm there, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do my job, I'm going to be nice, I'm going to be kind, I'm not going to gossip, I'm not going to you know, swear, I'm not going to trash people at the lunchroom table, I'm going to, I'll be nice to everybody, and I'll speak well, and I'll do my best, and I'll hold the door for, for somebody, I might even share my sandwich. And all those things are awesome, and you should keep doing them, but at a certain point, you have to couple, I'm going to live this with my actions, to I'm going to speak this with my words, right? And there's a tension there, isn't there? I, I understand the tension. I, I remember years ago when I was a, a, a new believer in Christ, a younger believer, and um, it's still with me to this day some, uh, to some degree, but I remember... Um, God rescued me from a destructive lifestyle, right? My life was a mess, okay? And so the people that I hung out with were in a mess. We, we lived a mess. And, and Jesus pulled me out of that. And so then all of a sudden, I was no longer hanging out with those people. And so they're like, hey, why aren't you hanging out with us, right? And so I, I kind of had to be like, well, I, you know, I accepted Jesus. I'm a Christian now and all that. And, and so they kind of understood, but not really. And I was just, well, I'm just, by, by me not showing up, my actions are revealing this to them. I'm no longer like you. I'm different. And I never forget, one of my friends at the time said to me, he's trying to understand it all, and he said this, said, if this whole Jesus thing is so important to you, why have you never told me about him? So I'm not coming at you today. I'm with you in it, okay? That's not called courage. That's called comfort. 
That's not called missional. That's called complacency, right? It's not urgency. That's, that's settling. And so, yes, observe my life and, 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 and see how I live. Notice that I have something that you don't have. Please continue to do that. But at a certain point, the Holy Spirit came to empower us to testify. I love this story uh, from Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are thrown in jail. They're going around telling people about the resurrection of Jesus. And they're like, you guys can't do that. And they arrest them and, and throw them in jail. Then they drag them in front of the Sanhedrin, which was the, the Jewish ruling council of the people. And they're like, what are you guys doing? What are you talking about? Why are you talking about this? What, stop doing it. And they say, you guys are no longer permitted to tell people about Jesus and about the resurrection. And they said, we've seen something so great we cannot help but speak about what we've seen and heard. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul prays, Paul says, pray for me that whenever I speak, so I'm going to speak, okay, and when I do, pray that words will be given to me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Live a life that leads to why, but you don't have to wait for people to ask it, okay? And again, I'm, I, there's a tension, I'm in this with you. I, I was with my daughter at a high school tennis match a week or so ago and uh, one of her friend's mother was sitting there and I said hi and all that and when we were leaving she said dad you should probably like talk to her and you know get to know her a little bit and I said you're right understand like I'm not good at that like I had that takes, I got to work myself up to, to talk to people and to say hi to people. And, and, and God did a work in me to, to get me to stand in front of people, right? And I'm much better. I'm, I'm comfortable now, at least, where I don't feel I'm going to throw up every time. But, but I'm awkward in one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just, I'm not good at it. I don't, I don't, so yeah, I, I should be doing it, but that's hard. It's hard. We're not all wired the same, are we? And so you might be like, I'm not wired for that. I get it. But understand, just because we're not wired that way, we can't discount something just because it makes us uncomfortable, right? Jesus gave us a mission, and just because we're not comfortable with it, we can't just throw it out, right? Where did we get the idea that we're supposed to be comfortable anyway? It's going to be hard. It's too hard. Yeah, it is hard. And so, in fact, it's so hard you can't do it. That's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us. So that you can do it. So Jesus told us to do it. And I'm pretty sure we know that we should, right? So well, let me just give you a few practical things uh, to take with you. Maybe to help us step in this direction of being a, a witness for Jesus, okay? So again, if you're a note taker, write these down. This is the first one. We witness as a natural response to that which we have experienced. We witness as a natural response to that which we have experienced. That's the purpose of a, a witness in court, isn't it? To testify to what they've experienced. Right? I saw this. I've experienced it. And so, so now I can tell you about it. I can tell you what I saw or experienced. I saw the guy. I know him. And so let me tell you about him. I can, I've experienced him. I know him. I can share with you what he's like. You share from your experience. And we do it all the time, don't we? Right? You, you go to a restaurant you've never been to, you shoot a low score on the golf course, you get, get a new car or something, you tell everybody about it. You got to go try someone. The pasta was great, right? You, 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 you buy something new, you tell everybody. You start dating somebody new or you get married, everybody knows about it. You have a baby, you don't keep that from your friends, do you? It's so exciting, you share that with everybody. Why? Because it's great news. This is good news and I got to share it with you, right? We tell everybody. And, and, and here's the thing. You didn't, you didn't need a three-point message to do it. You don't need that. Well, here's the seven steps you got to go through. No, this is awesome. I got to tell you about it. And so we share the news because I've experienced it and I want you to know about it. L let's demystify what it means to be a witness for Christ, okay? It means to share what you've experienced. I've had, a, I've had an encounter with Jesus. I've met Jesus. I've experienced him. He changed my life, and I want to share that with you. 
The second one, I want to encourage you to free yourself from the weight that you were not meant to carry. Free yourself from, from the things that God never meant for you to carry. I have a couple things that I want to say about this. The first is, I, I think many of us have a paralyzing fear when it comes to talking about Jesus or sharing the gospel or sharing our faith, is that we don't have the right words to say, right? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say. I don't, I, I don't know the Bible that well. I don't have verses memorized. I, I don't know. I'm not good at this kind of thing. I, don't, I can't answer all the questions that they might have. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. When you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how to defend yourselves or what to say, for at that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. I think for some of us, we go, I, I don't know what, we, what I would even say, and, and Jesus says, well, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. But we don't continue far enough in the plan that we need to say anything, right? Right? But then we still rely on that, well, and the enemy keeps us sidelined and, 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 and out of the game because I don't know what to say. We're not even trying to say. You don't have to have all the answers, church. Look at throughout scripture. Look through the gospels. People didn't have the answers. Let me read a few of these to you. John chapter 9. Jesus heals a blind man and the Pharisees are questioning. They're like, who did this? What happened? How did it work? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know who he was. I don't know if he's this or that. Here's what I know. I was blind, and now I see. And that guy did it. Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals a leper. And Jesus actually tells the leper, don't go tell anybody. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. He's like, this is too good. I can't keep it to myself. And listen, he didn't stop at the seminary on the way. No one gave him the blueprint. He's like, this, i got to tell people what I experienced. Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man, and he tells him, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So the man went away, and he began to proclaim throughout the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. If you don't know, the Decapolis, Deca, it was a group of 10 cities that were all in close proximity. So this guy met Jesus. Jesus worked in his life, and he turned into a missionary. He's like going all over the place. You got to, this guy, Jesus did this for me. Just go and tell everybody throughout the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be able to explain the divine depths of the Trinity. Have some theological treatise prepared or memorize the Bible. You need to tell people what Jesus has done in your life. He changed my life. And that's what the world needs to hear. Matthew 9, Jesus heals a dead girl, and it says, news of it spread throughout the whole region. People talked about it. John chapter 4, we know the story about the woman at the well. After that story, it says that, that, she, that many people came to put their faith in Jesus because she shared her testimony. Must have been a crazy testimony, right? Here it is, quote, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's it. That was her testimony, and people came, like, I got to meet this guy, and they put their faith in Jesus. So, so let's relieve this pressure that you need to have all the right answers and able to be a witness for Jesus, okay? You just, the only requirement is you've met Jesus, he's changed your life, and now you have the Spirit, amen? And so I want to lovingly lead us into this reality this morning, church, that, that not knowing enough is not a good enough reason to sit on the sidelines, you knew enough to put your faith in Jesus for your eternal. Amen? You know enough to tell somebody about it. Another freedom here. You are not responsible for somebody's salvation. Do you know that? You and I don't convert anybody to Christianity. We don't save people's souls. That's not your job. So when you do get bold enough to share something and that person says, yeah, no thanks, buddy. I'm not really interested. Your coworker's like, whatever, man. Or 
You know, people aren't really interested in it. They don't accept. They don't follow. That shouldn't give us a sense of failure, and it should not keep us from telling somebody again in the future because their salvation isn't your responsibility. Okay? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It's not just the person who receives salvation that can't boast. I can't boast about leading him to Jesus anyway. Because I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. It's a gift of God. God does the work. Amen? I'm not responsible for their conversion. I just need to be faithful in the proclamation. I need to be willing to share what Jesus has given me. He's given me life. I tell somebody about it. It's God who changes lives. It's Jesus who saves. You and I don't need to carry that burden. Okay? A couple more quickly, and then we're we're winding this down. Please do not let past complacency or past failure lead you to future failure when it comes to living as a witness. Okay? Don't let the fact that you messed up in the past stop you from living it now or in the future. Okay? One of the most powerful things that I read in this preparation this week uh, is the reality that when you flip over to, to chapter 2, that the first person to stand up when Pentecost comes and preaches the gospel is who? It's Peter. The same guy who denied Jesus three times. Not only was he not witnessing for Christ, he denied knowing him altogether. And yet, the Spirit comes, he's empowered, he gets back in the game, and he's the first person at Pentecost to stand up and, and, and tell the people about Jesus and proclaim the gospel. Wherever you've been in your past, whatever happened, whatever that looks like, the beauty of the gospel is there's always a new start. It's a fresh start. It's a new future. And the last one, we'll close with this. I want to encourage all of us to live on purpose and to live with purpose. Live on purpose and live with purpose. If we're going to be witnesses for Jesus, church, we have to stop seeing everything in life as happenstance. It's not all accidental, uh, it's not all coincidental, right? You know, I just lost my job and, uh, and, and, and well, now I got this job at the new place. That's, that's a way to look at it. Or you could choose to see it through gospel lenses of my assignment ended there, and so now I don't work there anymore, and now God has a new assignment, so now I'm over here with a new group of people with this message to share, a new opportunity to share the gospel in a new place. It's perspective, right? And I'm not saying that God made your boss fire you. Maybe he did. Maybe he tried to get you out of that place. He wanted to get you away from a bad work spot. Or maybe you're just bad at your job. I don't know. But I can tell you that God doesn't make accidents. That God doesn't operate where things are just coincidental. And I think we need to start looking at life with, with eyes that are wide open to the opportunity uh, and the assignment that God has given to us. So church, I want to call us up to that. To not be idle, but to live on purpose and to live with this purpose that Jesus has called the church into. As you look down to the, the end of that passage, the final verse of, that, of this passage in verse 9, uh, it says, after he said this, so after he gave them this instruction, their marching orders, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here? Looking in the sky, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. The angel said, why are you guys standing here looking in the sky for? Right? Jesus told you he's coming back, right? He told you he's going to return, and so while you wait, get busy with what he told you to do. He gave you something to do, right? Stop wasting time. You've been given a mission, you've been given a job to do, you've been given a purpose, you've been given the Holy Spirit, so you have power 
to do what Jesus asked you to do, get going. And, and church, that's, that's who we are. That's who we're called to be. And that's how we're called to live as the people of God and how we're called to live as the church. I met Jesus and he changed my life. And I want people to see my life and go, man, you have something that I don't have, but I can't wait around for them to just ask me. I need to tell somebody about it. And it doesn't need to be three main points or some theological treatise. People need to hear I met Jesus, and he changed my life. Let me tell you about him. I see where you are in your life, and I was there. And then I met Jesus. Let's be that kind of church. Amen? Let's be those kind of people, people on mission, while we're waiting for Jesus to return, people who aren't forsaking the very thing that Jesus gave us the instructions to do. He's given us the power required for the mission He's given the mission to the people of the church. It's a requirement for us. We need to get busy, amen? I want to encourage you, friends. Be praying for who needs Jesus. Be praying for your neighbor. Be praying for your family member. Be praying for your coworker. Be praying that God might give you the direction and the words to say. He promised the Spirit will give you the words to say. We need to stop using this as an excuse to let the enemy sideline us from not talking to people about Jesus. If you've experienced Jesus, you got a calling on your life to tell somebody else. That's the mission of the church. That's, that's where we're headed in this series, and I, and I pray you're on board with it. Amen. This is where we're going. We need to tell people about Jesus.